It's been ticking away since the deep chill of the Cold War. From the explosion of the Soviet's first atomic bomb to today's new nuclear threats, this icon of nuclear danger has gauged how close we have come to Armageddon. The world will end at the stroke of midnight, and only a few minutes remain on the doomsday clock, next on Modern Marvels. Good morning. I'm Stephen Schwartz, publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. February 27, 2002. A news conference in Chicago. There, George Lopez, chairman of the board for a magazine called Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, issued a warning. The September 11th attacks and the subsequent and probably unrelated use of the mail to deliver deadly anthrax spores breached previous boundaries for terrorist acts and should have been a full global wake-up call. Moving the clock's hands at this time reflects our growing concern that the international community has simply hit the snooze button rather than respond to the full alarm. Time, he said, was running out. To make the point dramatically clear, Nobel Prize winning physicist Leon Letterman set the minute hand at seven minutes to midnight on a symbolic timepiece dubbed the Doomsday Clock. It ominously suggested the nuclear danger the world faced. Anything inside 10 minutes is worthy of pretty serious concern. We think about both the events that have happened, which is normally what the clock responds to, and we think about what's likely to happen in the future. Since 1947, the minute hand of the doomsday clock has moved forward or backward 17 times as events have heightened or lessened the possibility of a nuclear war. The Enola Gay arrived at 8.11 a.m. In 10 seconds, the world will shake. In August 1945, the United States detonated its first nuclear weapons in Japan, ending World War II. The bomb's awesome power and the deaths of more than 100,000 people under the mushroom clouds in Hiroshima and Nagasaki greatly troubled some scientists. They were part of the Manhattan Project, the government's atomic bomb program. And they were afraid that they had unleashed a genie that could not ever be bottled, but they were going to do their damnedest to try to bottle it up again. Immediately after the war, a group of former Manhattan Project chemists and physicists began meeting in Chicago. Among them, John A. Simpson, inventor of a plutonium detection instrument. Harold C. Urey, a 1934 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Alexander Langsdorff, the inventor of a chamber for tracking cosmic rays, and Eugene Rabinowitz, co-author of the June 1945 memorandum that had urged the Secretary of War not to use the bomb against Japan. They wanted to break down the walls of secrecy, involve the public, and help them understand what this really meant for our future. And they were all motivated by that feeling, all of them. They call themselves the Atomic Scientists of Chicago. And they wanted to open the eyes of the public and policymakers about the significance of atomic power. So they published a newsletter called Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists of Chicago in December 1945. They founded it also out of their desire to ensure that uh, nuclear weapons would never again be used and that uh, mankind might perhaps learn to harness the uh, potential benefits of atomic energy. 44-year-old Eugene Rabinowitz, a Russian immigrant, became the Bulletin's first editor-in-chief. 
It was a title he held for more than 20 years. He was a small man, a round man, uh, a very uh, humble one, if you will, and really brilliant. There's no question about that. And he was a man dedicated, really dedicated, to the belief that science was a positive force uh, in the world and for the benefit of people. And that's really what kind of pushed him forward all the time. Initially, the bulletin was simply a six-page mimeograph journal. By 1947, circulation was up, and a magazine replaced the newsletter format. And so the editors asked uh, Martel, a, uh, a local artist who was also married to uh, one of the founders of the Bulletin, Alexander Langsdorf, to come up with something to put on the cover. One of the founders, Hi Goldsmith, knew about me as an artist. He gave no instructions. All he said is, it can't cost much. <laughs> it never was any money. So I did several concepts. And I thought about it. All the scientists felt an urgency to explain what had happened with the bomb. And because of the extreme urgency, I remember the clock seemed to be important. Martil's plan was to repeat a clock design every month on a different background color. In June 1947, the first bulletin clock cover appeared. It depicted the final quadrant of a clock face with a minute hand approaching midnight. The message was clear. The end of time was drawing close. While Martil intended the clock image as a whole to convey a psychological sense of imminent danger, placing the minute hand at seven minutes to midnight was simply a matter of aesthetics. I chose seven minutes because it seemed the right time on the page. It was the right design. It left room for the contents and it just suited my eye. The following month, Eugene Rabinowitz's essay to readers explained the symbolism of the clock of doom, as he called it. It represents the state of mind of those whose closeness to the development of atomic energy does not permit them to forget that their lives and those of their children, the security of their country, and the survival of civilization all hang in the balance as long as the specter of atomic war has not been exorcised. October 1949. President Harry Truman made an announcement that brought real meaning to the doomsday clock. We have been confronted with a new, powerful imperialism. The United States, he said, had evidence of an atomic explosion in the Soviet Union. The bulletin's editors knew that the East-West nuclear arms race that they had foreseen was now underway. The scientists explain very calmly that once it's obvious to the world that such weapons can be built, it's only a matter of time uh, before they will be built by any technically competent country with access to the right materials and the right knowledge. In response to the Soviet's atomic bomb, Rabinowitz wrote in the October 1949 issue, We do not advise Americans that doomsday is near and that they can expect atomic bombs to start falling on their heads a month or a year from now. But we think they have reason to be deeply alarmed and to be prepared for grave decisions. To dramatize the point, Rabinowitz reset the clock's minute hand on the bulletin's cover. Three minutes to midnight. The clock unexpectedly took on new meaning for the magazine's editors. Suddenly they realized they had a, a very important um, tool here that could help uh, educate people. And in the beginning, it was certainly seen as a way to tell quickly and symbolically a, a public out there that, gee, life is better or life is not so good. Or things are changing. You better watch out. But the clock symbolism didn't fully capture the public's attention until the explosion of a new, more powerful weapon of mass destruction. In its day, the Manhattan Project was the largest industrial and scientific effort in history. 
It cost more than $2 billion in 1945 and employed more than 175,000 people. The Doomsday Clock will return in a moment. Russia becomes an atomic power. America's monopoly is ended. The Soviets' detonation of the atom bomb in 1949 rekindled a secret high-level U.S. debate left simmering since the early days of the Manhattan Project. Should the United States build a super bomb, a hydrogen bomb far more powerful than the largest atom bomb? These were weapons uh, of a completely different order of magnitude. Uh, atomic bombs could destroy parts of cities, or if they were small, entire cities. Whereas hydrogen bombs could destroy countries. And of course, there was no limit to the explosive power of a hydrogen bomb. There was a time where the world itself was very unsettled. Independence movements in Africa, in Latin America. Almost uncontrolled rioting. Uh, and then, of course, the struggle between the communist world and the non-communist world. You add to this the destructive power of nuclear weapons, and it's like you're building a big bonfire in the middle of everything. And who's going to light the fuse? On October 31st, 1952, the United States detonated its first super bomb, a thermonuclear device with a human name, Mike. But in fact, it was a people killer with a yield nearly 1,000 times greater than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. test site, an atoll called Aluja Lab in the Marshall Islands, disappeared, leaving only a crater 160 feet deep and more than a mile wide. Nine months later, in August 1953, the Russians exploded a less powerful but still awesome thermonuclear device. When word of the Soviet test got out, the September 1953 bulletin cover was remade at the last moment. Eugene Rabinowitz again decided to reset the doomsday clock, this time to two minutes to midnight. The closest for midnight that the clock has ever been was 1953. This is life and death stuff. The power of, of both countries to utterly annihilate each other and take the rest of the world with them was quickly becoming a reality. The bulletin editors weren't saying we're going to have a nuclear war right tomorrow because of this. But they were saying we'd crossed a threshold. We were truly participating in a nuclear arms race that didn't have any finish line. The latest bulletin cover garnered great attention for the doomsday clock, transforming it into one of the best known symbols of the nuclear age. In the beginning, it was kind of called the Chicago clock, you know, the Chicago bulletin. No one thought of it as a national uh, institution. and. Um, when things became uh, very serious, like when the H-bomb came about, I think the clock suddenly emerged as a national institution. It's just something that people, I think, intuitively understand. We may not understand exactly the symbolism of seven minutes versus five or three, but you can see it marching further away from or closer to midnight and understand what that means. Rabinowitz did not move the clock's minute hand again until a new threat in another part of the world reached the flashpoint. On October 31, 1956, Egypt was invaded by Israel, Great Britain and France. They wanted to oust Egyptian leader Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser who in July had nationalized the British and French-owned Suez Canal. President Dwight Eisenhower faced a dilemma. If the United States supported its three allies, Nasser might turn to the Soviet Union for help. President Eisenhower backed the United Nations and forced the uh, British and the French and Israelis to back off. And the uh, bulletin editors and the board of directors were always very much in favor of multilateral solutions to conflicts. Persuade Israeli, British, and French troops to lay down their arms. In response to Eisenhower's efforts, Rabinowitz set the doomsday clock back to seven minutes before midnight. In January 1960, he wrote, 
A new cohesive force has entered the interplay of forces shaping the face of mankind and it is making the future of man a little less foreboding. Then, in October 1962, a confrontation between Washington and Moscow over the president of Soviet missiles in Cuba brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. On Saturday afternoon, October 27, 1962, at 4 p.m., I remember as over yesterday, the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended we launch our, the planned attack, or the contingency attack, against Cuba. The first day's air attack was planned at 1080 sorties. That's larger than any single day's attack on Kosovo. We had 180,000 troops mobilized in southeast U.S. ports with the shipping to take them there. We came that close. When the Soviet leader found out about the imminent U.S. invasion, he agreed to remove the missiles. And Russia has decided to end its billion-dollar venture. The missiles go home. There were 170 nuclear warheads on the soil of Cuba. If, if, if our invasion force had uh, attempted to land on Cuba, there's absolutely no question in my mind but what the Soviets would have used uh, the tactical nuclear weapons. The Cuban Missile Crisis strangely failed to produce so much as a tick on the doomsday clock. My sense is that it was over too quickly. Remember, it was just the 13 days of, of October and the clock reacts to trends. There's the irony of looking at and saying, yes, that was a large event, but I think it's been larger in history than it was at the time. I'm not sure very many people knew we were that close at the time. Having peered into the nuclear abyss, U.S. and Soviet leaders put more emphasis on diplomacy. Each side talked about a test ban treaty of some kind, uh, hopefully one that would ban tests in the atmosphere and underground tests as well. But we were concerned that, that we would not be able to know when they were carrying out underground tests. So we gave up, sadly from my point of view, we gave up the negotiations on on uh, unlimited test ban, and we we put through just barely, by the way, a, a limited test ban. The president hails the agreement with Russia with a note of caution. In 1963, the two countries signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty, eliminating all but underground nuclear tests. The clock did react when the Partial Test Ban Treaty was signed, and that was negotiated as a direct consequence of the enormous fear that everybody felt uh, out, of the, out of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the clock did react, it just reacted later to, a, to, a, to an event that was connected to the crisis. The Doomsday Clock rewound again in 1963, 12 minutes to midnight. But the optimism was short-lived. In October 1964, China detonated an atomic bomb. China became the fifth nation to have a nuclear bomb, joining the United States, Russia, Great Britain, and France. And the fear was it would now spiral out of control. China actually was a country that advocated proliferation at that time. A global arms buildup and increased nationalism ultimately led to war, the U.S. and Vietnam in 1964, India and Pakistan in 1965, Israel against Jordan, Syria and Egypt in 1967. By 1968, Eugene Rabinowitz believed that international cooperation was quickly being diminished by international anarchy. 
He wrote an apocryphal editorial under the title The Dismal Record and jumped the doomsday clock forward seven minutes to midnight. If the editorial mood at the bulletin was gloomy, the scientists personally still held hope for the world. Kennedy started the effort, Johnson finished it, and Nixon signed it. And that was the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The 1969 treaty authorized the five nations holding nuclear weapons to help other states develop nuclear power. In turn, the non-nuclear states agreed not to develop or obtain nuclear weapons. It grew from an original 70 countries now to every country in the world except for India, Israel, and Pakistan. Rabinowitz was encouraged by the agreement. In the April 1969 issue, he reset the clock's minute hand to 10 minutes. But hope waned with a new threat of nuclear war. It would be Europe that would be turned into cinders, not the United States or the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union Tsar Bama was the largest nuclear weapon ever constructed and detonated. Tested in 1961, the fusion bomb's yield was 50 megatons, with a design capable of an estimated 100 megatons. The doomsday clock will return in a moment. By the late 1960s, the arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union threatened to spin out of control. Finally, in 1969, the two superpowers agreed to discuss a reduction of nuclear weapons. The leaderships of the two countries had just encountered each other every once in a while at summit meetings, but they'd never really been able to engage on reducing or eliminating or controlling nuclear weapons. And in the late 1960s, the Soviets finally agreed that this is something that they would be willing at least to discuss. Three years after negotiations had begun at the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, or SALT, President Richard Nixon and General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev signed two agreements in Moscow. The Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty limited the deployment of ABM defenses, and the interim agreement froze the number of strategic ballistic missiles at 1972 levels, but only for five years. was putting a cap on the arms race, essentially. And it worked. It, 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 it didn't prevent the development of all nuclear weapons, but it prevented the arms race from spiraling completely out of control. In June 1972, Bernard Feld, a member of the Bulletin's Board of Directors, wrote that the board was generally pleased with the ABM treaty, but wary of the interim agreement. Still, SALT II treaty negotiations were set to begin later in the year. In a hopeful spirit, the clock was moved backwards. The new time, 12 minutes to midnight, then the farthest jump back. On May 15, 1973, Eugene Rabinowitz died. The bulletin lost its principal intellectual and editorial voice. 53-year-old physicist Bernard Feld became the new editor-in-chief. As a research scientist, he had helped usher in the atomic era. As a concerned scientist, he advocated nuclear disarmament. By 1974, the Bulletin's board adopted a new system to reset the doomsday clock. It would no longer be the decision of one man. Instead, members would have to come to a consensus. In May, the board made its first decision to reset the clock. India exploded what it called a nuclear device. They didn't call it a bomb. They were very adamant about not calling it a bomb, but everybody knew exactly what it was. In 1974, the new time was nine minutes before midnight. It wouldn't stop there. Five years later, 
On December 26, 1979, the Soviet Union dispatched tanks and troops to Afghanistan to prop up a pro-Soviet government. The relationship between Moscow and Washington worsened. There was a great fear that this was an early sign that the Soviet Union was going to be throwing its uh, military weight around and might even decide it was time to invade Europe. So it was of great concern to the NATO alliance and to the United States as well. President Jimmy Carter asked the Senate to postpone action on SALT II, the arms limitation initiative that he and General Secretary Brezhnev had recently signed. Afghanistan just completely pushed the U.S.-Soviet relationship off track. Bernard Feld offered his general assessment of an unstable world in the bulletin's January 1980 issue. SALT II had stalled again. Religious fanaticism in the Middle East was on the rise and millions were being killed by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. The minute hand was moved forward and set at seven minutes to midnight. Well, here we are back again at seven minutes to midnight, back where we started. This is a very troubling time for, for a lot of the people at the bulletin. and I think they, they wanted to reflect that in the clock. The new decade had barely begun when suddenly nuclear war in Europe seemed possible. The Soviet Union had deployed a new generation of strategic weapons. They were called the SS-20 in related systems, and these were intermediate range weapons. That is, from the territory of the Soviet Union, they could strike all the major capitals of Europe. As a countermeasure, the U.S. deployed its own missiles on hair-trigger alert in NATO Europe. We called ours the Pershing missiles and the uh, ground-launched cruise missiles. So a new phase of the nuclear arms race opened up in Europe. That if there was a conflict and it went nuclear, it would be Europe that would be turned into cinders, not the United States or the Soviet Union. January 1981, Bernard Feld wrote, Both sides willfully delude themselves that a nuclear war can remain limited or even be won. In 1980, both sides officially declared nuclear war thinkable. Thinkable dictated a radical change. Four minutes to midnight. The President of the United States. The weapons buildup that began with President Carter was expanded and accelerated under President Ronald Reagan. Mission Director acknowledged. He had campaigned on the position that the United States had become dangerously weak in relation to the Soviet Union. Two, one, mark. Salt II was, in his opinion, fatally flawed. The way to end the Cold War was to win it by destroying the evil Soviet Union. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. The bulletin had no illusions about the Soviet Union. They simply thought the two countries had to work together. When uh, Reagan made his evil empire speech, it seemed to indicate to many, including editors at the Bulletin, uh, that Reagan had a different vision, and that scared them greatly. Reagan purported that America needed to construct an impermeable shield in space. In 1983, he announced an extensive research and development effort, the Strategic Defense Initiative, for the purpose of building the perfect missile defense program. We seek neither military superiority no political advantage. Our only purpose, one all people share, is to search for ways to reduce the danger of nuclear war. Critics quickly dubbed Reagan's plan Star Wars after the movie. They complained that if it worked, it would violate the anti-ballistic missile treaty, encourage the militarization of space, and lead to the resumption of an all-out nuclear arms race. As soon as the United States contemplated a perfect ballistic missile defense, then the Russian strategic arsenal and its capabilities was undermined. And so as a result, the Soviets were initially very, very concerned about the strategic defense initiative. January 1984, bulletin editors reacted. The doomsday clock moved dramatically forward three minutes to midnight, the closest it had come to zero hour since the Soviets' detonation of the hydrogen bomb in 1953. Well, I think it was right for many people, both professional people, such as the people employed at the Bulletin, as well as just 
everyday folks to be very, very concerned about where things were going to go next. And that's what the clock was reflecting. But then the two superpowers did something that struck the editors of the bulletin as near miraculous. This was simply unheard of historically. A recent study estimates that more than 28,000 nuclear weapons are currently maintained by the world's eight known nuclear powers, most in the U.S. and Russia. The Doomsday Clock will return in a moment. We maintain our strength in order to deter and defend against aggression. While President Reagan's strategic defense initiative threatened U.S.-Soviet relations, the Bulletin's board of directors found a reason for optimism. The Soviet Union and the United States had agreed on a treaty that eliminated a whole class of weapons. After After years of deadlock, President Ronald Reagan and General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev had negotiated an arms agreement in 1987. The Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty not only eliminated an entire class of weapons in Europe, but from all U.S. and Soviet arsenals. This was simply unheard of historically, and it showed, I think, that the two countries were beginning, even then, the process of opening that led eventually to the demise of the Soviet Union. It was a simple proposal, one might say disarmingly simple. <laughs> the INF Treaty struck many, including the Bulletin's board members, as remarkable. The Reagan administration, um, by the end of its first term, was on the defensive. It had come in with very strong pro-nuclear weapons policies and, and, and was met by a, a global wave of protests against the policies. It wasn't until the second term that Reagan really turned from a defensive buildup to an arms uh, negotiated reduction process. And in the second term, Ronald Reagan became probably the greatest arms control president in U.S. history. For the first time in history, the language of arms control was replaced by arms reduction. The events had an impact on the bulletin. In 1988, the clock was reset to six minutes before midnight. The board members had always tried to spot trends before they reset the clock, but they could not have imagined what occurred next. On November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, a resounding signal that the Cold War was near an end prediction changed a lot after 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall because so many things happened that many of us thought we wouldn't see in our lifetimes. Popular democratic revolution swept every communist regime in Eastern Europe out of power. The doomsday clock received an over...
Thank <laughs> you.